Happy holidays, everyone. Uh, as a quick disclosure, kids are off school today. So if you see two young kids running around, they're mine. So <laughs> I appreciate your appreciate your patience. They're fighting about something. What? I have no idea. Thank you all very much for spending the day after Thanksgiving with us. We're incredibly grateful that you're part of our community. And uh, I suspect we'll have fewer participants today because of the holiday, but whoever is here, we're grateful. We want to answer your questions. Uh, what I hoped our team would do is spend a few minutes talking a little bit about holidays in prison. Perhaps Sam, Jason, or Sam, Scott can share their experience. And then perhaps uh, this webinar doesn't quite have the same structure we've had in every other webinar because it's the day after the holiday. And I thought we'd have free flowing conversation and perhaps debunk what you may expect to happen in prison during the holiday season. Some of what I saw while in custody. And um, if anyone wants to chime in, for example, I see someone leaving a message that said I was just released from from custody. We'd be very grateful if you share your experiences and we're welcome home. As always, I'm recording this and I encourage all of you to continue to go through our free resources at Prison Professors. We're producing a lot of content designed to help guide you. Nate Schott, happy belated birthday. Good to see you. Nate just got off federal probation early, everyone, after 21 months on a 36 months probation. He got a federal probation early and he still owes restitution, which tells you it's possible. So if you have questions about getting off probation early, uh, speak with Sam or Scott. We can coordinate. Nate can share his experience experience with you as well. It's great because Nate's actually able to travel the country more freely. He was just out in Irvine spending time with me. So if you want to get off probation early, uh, uh, continue to offer insights on, on how to do that. Okay. So I encourage you to go through all of the resources. As a reminder, we can't change the past. The fact that you're immersed oh. in a government investigation. I'm going to mute all of you. I cannot change that many that a number of people, even those who attend our webinars, go to prison and immediately make bad decisions. For example, someone who is in our community went to prison, came home, went to the halfway house, and spoke disrespectfully. <clears throat> spoke disrespectfully, apparently, to the case manager who didn't approve the job. Then they gave him a warning. Then he had a pass and he didn't get back on time. He said, oh, there was some traffic and this and that. And they said, really, have a nice day. You're going to go finish the rest of your 45 days at Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, New York. Have a nice day. You're still in custody. So never forget the government. They're watching. They're, they're on you. You're not free. You are not free until you are free. And it's essential that you continue to make very good decisions throughout the whole process don't think just because you're out of prison, the trouble's in. Before we actually get a little bit into holidays in prison, I want to welcome some of people watch my videos and see me using really expensive tools. And they think, yeah, but how can I, I do it? I muted everyone. Okay. When this video, I see I'm some, it's funny, I've muted everyone, but I continue to hear noise in the background. I don't know what it is. Okay, thank you. Justin, it could be one of your, do you have something running in the background? It could be my kids. Is that what you're telling me? No. no I or a, a YouTube or something running in the background? Uh, uh, no, no, it's. It's not me. Oh, okay, so let's, I want to welcome Kent to our community. Kent is a, a client. And Kent, just share a couple of minutes about what happened recently at your sentencing hearing, but more so some of the work that you put in because it ties to all of our advocacy work. So Kent, welcome. Yeah, I appreciate Jim. Um, happy to share my story. So I've, uh, I'll, I'll give kind of the, the cliff notes to catch you up and then where, where I'm, I guess I'm at in my process now is I got indicted in September of 2019. I got a target letter in February of 2019 um, and ended up finding Justin and the prison professors team probably about maybe two years or so ago and was kind of lost at the time, but started following the straight A guide and really made some changes. So went back. I know Justin's talked about you can't change the past. It's something I kept repeating over and over again, but I can prepare for this in a different way. Um, did a bunch of different things, um, ended up losing my job, finding another one, have jobs lined up before I go out, um, prepared for the PSR, wrote a narrative, got a bunch of letters, um, started volunteering. Um, I just kind of built, built a case and I really was genuine in, in preparing myself for the second half of my life. Um, but to the results of it, I was sentenced two weeks ago and the government was asking for 57 to 60 months, and I ended up getting sentenced to 15. So much, much greater result than we were expecting for, and very, very grateful for the work that I did and the help that I had from the team so far. 
And uh, it's not done yet, but obviously a great first step. I appreciate you sharing that. And I want to be clear, had Ken got the guideline recommendation, um, or even if a case manager in prison says to you, hey, great, you did all of this work, or if they throw it in the round file, and if you still don't get what you want, it will still influence somebody at some point. But also, you've done that work leading up to that process. Even if Kent had got the 57 months, what has happened between the time he started in the sentencing? He will have had a beautiful narrative, character reference letters, cultivated relationships, did volunteer work. So he had done a ton of work, even if the end result was the judge says, I'm going to give you a guideline sentence. Some people think if they get that guideline sentence, the work or advocacy they've done is suddenly meaningless. It ain't so. At some point, it's going to influence somebody. It could be some a case manager in prison. It could be an employer down the road. There's a good chance maybe Kent joins our team someday. Why? The work, the record he's created, and he will have myriad opportunities making him competitive because he's documented it. Even if he had gotten the 57 months, he has this documentation, including this very cool video he filmed after sentencing, which is something that all of you can do. I'm not saying it should go on TikTok or YouTube or anything like that, but I encourage you for your family's sake to try to memorialize this experience. Even if that, like Jonathan, our friend, my good friend, we've worked together since COVID in March of 20, surrenders next week. He's, you know, he's feeling it. He's going in December 1st for four years. He will come home differently. He'll feel differently the first that second week than he does the first day. I'm a big believer in documenting it and authenticating it because then you can really measure the progress and change and growth. And Jonathan, I hope that's something you'll do. Not saying it's going to go on YouTube, even if it's just for your kids. So Kent, thank you very much for sharing that. Let me quickly share my experience in federal prison in the holidays. And I'm very grateful and thankful that I only serve one Thanksgiving and one Christmas or Hanukkah in my case. What I recall about Thanksgiving in federal prison was it felt like a slower day. And I'm going to want Sam and Scott to share some of their insights, perhaps Nate as well. It felt like a much slower day because it lacked the structure and busyness of like a regular Monday to Friday. So like with Mondays, I knew I would get up really early and go to the chow hall and I'd run. And there was it was just very active and busy. Yet on the holidays and on the weekends, it lacked a little bit of that structure. In our case, uh, when we went to the chow hall at 11 a.m., they gave us lunch. They also gave us a bag lunch that evening so guards could go home early. It was totally shut down. There wasn't any uh, programming, very little staff. I've read that some prisoners may have gotten like turkey and mashed potatoes and had a real nice dinner. That wasn't the case with me. They gave us like, a, I think it was a bologna sandwich and an apple, kind of like what you get when you may be in segregation or when you check in and they give you a meal. But in my case, I just found it to lack some of the structure. And for many people, that the day felt longer. There were people that can visit on Thanksgiving and national holidays. That The problem and something you should consider visiting in prison is um, it could get much busier if you visit on a holiday, which means they could shut the visit down a little bit earlier if people are waiting. So I never visited on a federal holiday for a reason that it could get shut down. But I understand some people who may not be working it may be a, just a great opportunity to visit, but I chose not to visit on any federal holidays for that reason. A, a number of guys, as you would imagine, it was incredibly depressing and, and hard to, to be in custody uh, on a holiday, missing things at home. And what our team stresses continually is, and, and I heard this, and it's easy for me to say because I wasn't married, nor did I have children. It was heartbreaking when I hear prisoners call home and just make matters worse. Um, the family's missing you. They love you. They support you. But to call home and kind of kvetch and complain and make matters worse, and I shouldn't be here, and I can't believe you're not here visiting with me, and I'm alone. And to hear these things then kind of takes what is a tough Thanksgiving and makes it you know, measurably worse. And I have no doubt some of the prisoners got off the phone and had regrets. So I'm not encouraging any of you to lie, but Jonathan, you're going to be in for Hanukkah. Okay. I know you're going to miss some events and your family, when they take your phone callers, how are you? Yeah, I'm one day closer to home. I'm so bummed that I'm not with you for Hanukkah, but I'm going to be soon. I love you. And I miss you. And I'm so grateful you're holding down the fort without me. I'm going to be productive. This is what I'm doing. That's a fundamentally different call than what people make, which I'm sad. It's depressed. It's not my, and I, I, I get it. And it may take some time for people to get there, but never forget this is harder on the family. So my experience, holidays in prison, the day they slow down, it felt longer for some, it lacks the structure, and it was a day for guys to either to be productive or you know power through it, or it could be a day where they just sit around watching TV all day in some ways, not like any other days in prison. With that said, Sam, can you chime in? How many holidays were you in prison, Sam, and, and what experience did you see? 
Two Thanksgivings. Um, yeah, you're right. It was very unstructured. There's only two meals typically at breakfast and you had uh, an early uh, lunch slash dinner where they gave you, and it was well known, a turkey thigh about, oh, I don't know, a foot and a half long. Uh, the problem was it was it was all tendon. So while you had a very large turkey leg, it was all this white tendon. You couldn't eat it. And then they gave you a bag lunch for dinner. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I have no idea what that means. I, I don't cook. What does tendon mean? I, 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 it's I'm like um, a, 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 it's a very thick. Oh, gosh. What is it like? A, an edible? They give you a foot. No, you can't eat it. Oh, you can't eat it. That's no, no. Okay. It's like gristle, like gristle. You know, yeah, that, sounds, that sounds atrocious. Thank it's you. It's something you don't see in any normal turkey leg other than being in prison. Okay. Uh, but it was, you know, something that, that you went and, and it was something different. Um, my wife, I encouraged not to come. First, I wanted her to be with her family. I thought it'd be, from my point of view, selfish to come uh, when we had the kids and her family. So I really encouraged her, be with your family uh, for the holiday. She came on the weekend. She would come the following weekend. It was just better for me. Uh, plus, you're right. In Miami, when I was there, there were 370 people, a very small visiting room. So they had to rotate you through very quickly. But I just preferred that she was with her family. Um, it was a uh, the first one, first Thanksgiving, a lot of organized activities. Uh, there was uh, a bocce championship. There was soccer. And again, in Miami, so everything was outside. Um, there was a lot of outdoor um, group activities that were done. And then football, everybody got around and, you know, watched college games and things like that. But, you know, it's lonely. There's no question you're sitting there eating this turkey leg by yourself and, you know, your family's home and, and doing what they should be doing. So just a matter of taking it in stride and understanding it is temporary. Everything that is there, it will be over soon. And dealing with it and not making your loved ones feel guilty about not being there or what you're going through. So I would make light about what I'm eating because it wouldn't be fair to my family to put them through any more stress than, than they were already under. Th thank you, Sam. Nate, perhaps before Scott, I, I'd also, I found the Bureau of Prisons, while at times they get criticism, I thought they were pretty respectful of religion, especially during the holiday season. I recall when where I was at Taft, there were a number of uh, prisoners who participated in, in choir and, and group, and they were very supportive of going to religious services during the, the holiday season. I'm wondering, Nate, did you see some of that at, at Montgomery and during yeah. the holiday season? And perhaps talk about your Nate served a 30 was sentenced to 33 months. He was home in about 10 months, which is great. He was at Montgomery, but maybe chime in, Nate, on what you saw during the holiday season. And let's touch on religious services a little bit in prison. Yeah, absolutely. They were very, very good about that. I mean, from the Protestant services, Jewish services, I mean, any really belief system you had, they were good about that. Um, and it was, was like Sam said, it seemed a little bit more lax around that time. And, and there was a little bit, as much as you could be that way, there was a little bit of that holiday spirit in that season at least floating around the camp as best as it as best it could, you know. I mean, the COs seemed to be a little bit more friendly or understand what everybody was going through. So, I mean, they, they really tried to make it the best they could. And I found that too. And the same thing with meals. Um, for religious meals that we had there, they were really courteous about doing that to your belief system and whatever you did. You had to sign up for all that stuff through the chapel if you're going to uh, Montgomery, and I'm sure you had to do that everywhere else. But but they were not only acknowledged it, but helped it. <clears throat> and the other thing was a lot of times, I mean, Justin, you and I spoke about um, visits, and I had a lot of visits. I mean, I had people visiting a lot. I liked it. It was good for me. It was good for my family. They wanted to do that stuff. So we actually spent three straight days on those uh, benches in the visitation area. And, you know, I had four kids from 22 down to the age of 12. My wife came and um, they'll say it's probably the best Christmas they've had in a long time because there are no cell phones. There's no distraction. We're playing games, you know, talking, visiting, um, you know, really uh, just being together. So it was it was great that way. Um, I did not leave for that meal. I think it was the same meal Sam got. They got a turkey leg and the guys said it wasn't that edible but <laughs> but the vending machines that we had at, at Montgomery were so much better than pretty much anything that you could get 
from uh, the regular chow hall. But it was uh, um, one thing I would say is be careful <clears throat> on the visits. If you're one that is either, either going to get a lot of visits, want or like a lot of visits, and you can have those, you know, be careful about um, you're not going to boast about those. But just be very careful going back into the yard or when you get back in with other prisoners, because there's so many, um, you know, of your of your friends that aren't going to get even phone calls. And, you know, you'll see that a lot. Same thing with mail call. And I know this is this is about holidays, but, you know, I, I was one that tended to get a lot of mail. And hopefully you guys will, too, because you're going to do that. You know, you're going to prepare for the best possible outcome. And by doing that, you're going to need a lot. You're going to get a lot of information sent to you. Well, you know, they do mail call like dogs coming around a trough, you know, and which is crazy. I mean, they call it out. And, and I, I ran into so many people that never, ever got mail, but they would still come in hopes of getting something. So so be very, very sensitive to that. And the same thing with visiting. But but it was I mean, it was really good, actually. I mean, they did the best they could do at Montgomery and, and they made it made it good for us. I appreciate that, Nate. I remember some prisoners walking in when we went into the dorm. There was a, there was a Jewish tree and a big Christmas tree, and some prisoners were like excited by it. Others were like, "How depressing to walk in to see this while in prison." You can't you can't win. Sometimes the way they did it at Taft was I know some prisons they may hand out candy on Halloween or, or some gifts during holiday time. I think they were running short at Taft, and they were kind of awarding holiday gifts and candy based on like the cleanliness of the dorm. And uh, your cubicle, like there's a weekly inspection in the winter, could go to the chow hall first and then also get popcorn or candy. And like our dorm didn't win and some prisoners really expected it and wanted it, especially if they don't have a lot of money to shop in the commissary. So you don't want to let your guard down, but you can expect some tempers to flare potentially during holiday season. As people feel forgotten, Nate speaks on uh, the mail call. There were times by way of uh, the, the blog that I was working on with Michael where people would send a lot of letters just thanking me for it. And it would it was very off putting to a number of people um, that I was getting them and they get jealous and forgotten about and, and they get angry. It's kind of the same thing if you go to the commissary shop and you roll <clears throat> your whole limit You're like, hey, can you help me carry all this food back? You know, that's off putting to people. Be deliberate. Understand your environment. Recognize people are watching. Okay, Scott, Scott, tell us a little bit about your experience holiday at Yankton, South Dakota, federal prison. Camp. Sure, sure. Um, I almost feel bad sharing this story. I, I had a great Thanksgiving there. Be I, happy. We people here are going to prison. We don't want them to think it's going to be a slow, depressing day. Uplift us. Just tell the truth, whether it's good or bad. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And as I've said on webinars in the past, one of the aspects of federal prison that I drastically underestimated is that there will be a lot of people there who you enjoy spending time with. It won't be 100% of them, but you'll find more people you connect with than you're anticipating. And a lot of these guys, just as when Justin went to prison and met Michael, who had been down for what by then, Justin, 21 years, 22 years, you're spending time with people who know how to do this, who have been through Thanksgivings and holidays before. And there was, there was such a camaraderie we ended up having a fantastic Thanksgiving meal. Everyone working in the kitchen took pride in it. They wanted to make a nice lunch for us. Uh, we also had bagged lunches, took those back to the unit. And that night, everyone's cooking. They're making burritos. The irons are out. We're sitting around small tables, sharing food, laughing. We had access to the gym that night. Everyone's playing pickleball and handball. And sure, you, you miss your family and you miss your friends. And of course, there's other places you'd rather be. But that's where I was for that Thanksgiving. And it was it was far less depressing than I had anticipated. Um, I actually wrote a post about it on my blog that I will copy and paste in the comments here in a section, or comments section here in a moment. However, I, I think the idea to go in there with is the holidays don't need to be met, don't need to be uh, as bad as you think they might be, and they can actually be somewhat enjoyable. I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing that. If you want to put a link to that, uh, that I think that would be uh, terrific. Yep. Here we go. I'll do that right now. That That's good. Um, I'd like to make this a little more interactive because this webinar is a little less structured after the holiday, probably, probably be a little shorter, which is fine. Jonathan, if you would engage us, uh, I know it's been a long journey. You're heading in next week. 
I understand mm -hmm. Jonathan, like many of you on this webinar, and I would do the same thing that Jonathan did. Sam and I joke about this, uh, the fixation on getting out as quickly as possible based on the, the sentence. So I encourage you to go through our calculator, watch the webinars on disciplinary infractions so you don't get into trouble and lose good time and have problems. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of dynamics to work through. But aside from wanting to get out as quickly as possible, Jonathan, what are some concerns you have with your imminent surrender to Miami next week for 48 months? Um, I think the, the most uh, thing that is been weighing heavily on my mind is just sleeping where you know where will I be sleeping will you know I've been told I snore am I gonna piss people off um just kind of concerned more about that really than anything these days I'm not so concerned about commissary or food I'm sure I'll eat um I'm sure I'll meet nice people there that I get along with just like Scott mentions uh I think really just the sleeping aspect is really the part that's making me the most nervous Let's let's talk about that for a moment. Snoring, uh, it can be a problem and it's frustrating to people because we value rest. So, so we, we value rest. In my experience, a lot of guys that snored once they got into a little bit better shape, I'm not a doctor here, they tended to, to snore less uh, as they got a little bit healthier and stronger. That said, is it a horrific snoring problem? Like, well, it will wake up the town because that can... When I was in prison, when guys were, ex I have thoughts on it, but answer that question and I'll, I'll is, it, is it? You know, I, 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 I've been told, you know, depends on the night. So. so let me tell you what I saw in prison and Sam and Scott, if you have insights. Yeah. There was one guy, he was in prison for smuggling turtles in illegally from China. He got caught at LA. <laughs> yeah, these exotic turtles. And mm -hmm. he was he was overweight. Okay, that's fine. But what and he snored to the point where it could shake the the, the dorm. But here, here was the problem people had. He smoked all day. This is when you can smoke in prisons. You were allowed to buy cigarettes attacked. He smoked all day. He ate poorly all day. Uh, and guys didn't feel like he was trying to do anything at all to try to improve his snoring because of the smoke and the ED now with COVID, he'd have probably been released in nine seconds. It was so unhealthy. He should have been in a medical spot. Mm -hmm. But that's what really upset guys, that he wasn't even trying. So when he would sleep, sleep, guys would go throw their jackets on him. They would throw rolls of toilet paper on him. Couple that with another guy who also snored pretty loudly, but they saw him eating better and exercising, drinking a lot of water, trying to do better. He adjusted really well. He didn't complain. So naturally, even though initially he snored as bad, they took it easier on him because at least they saw he was trying to get healthier and better. And in time, he really, he really did. So Sam, you're going to, you're at Miami, we're a touch on that a little bit, if you would, the, the snoring issue. Sure. So we had a guy that needed a CPAP machine. And if I tell you, I was in a dorm with 75 guys, it was like sleeping under a train track. I've never heard anything like it. Well, what happened was it was my second or third night. There's guys who work in landscaping and construction that have access to earplugs. So they would just throughout the unit, one guy would come back from landscaping with 200 sets of earplugs and he would just give them out to anybody in the unit that wanted them. So you, Jonathan, I can tell you, you will have access to that. They don't, you know, they don't charge you for it. You know, they're sleeping in the same conditions. So they bring back, you know, these multicolored earplugs and that, that the story. Eventually, you got a CPAP machine and it was fine. But there are people, that, everybody's in the same predicament. Everybody hears the snoring. So there's people literally in, in landscaping, you use the you know, lawnmowers and things like that and the tractors that have to use earplugs. They just bring them back for you and they'll give you the earplugs. Yes. This, is what, this, this is what I know. If you're adjusting well, I, I made a, a lot of, I did a lot of dumb things while, when I was in prison, a lot of stupid mistakes that I should have known better. But because I did everything else pretty well, the guys would give me a pass. But if I was both arrogant and rude and entitled and did some of the things that I did, like talking too loudly on my iPhone, when I got my release date, November 19th, 2008, and I'm calling cell phones in Los Angeles. I'm like, hey, I got my release date. I'll be home in six months. This is the greatest thing ever. And I'm yelling where everyone in the dorm can hear. That's stupid. That's not, not understanding my environment. When guys are thinking, this guy's talking about going home in six months. I have six years left to serve. Had I not done everything else well, it could have been a problem. So 
you will make mistakes and you may not be able to control your snoring, Jonathan, though, if you're doing everything else correctly, guys are going to say, Hey man, give the guy a break. But if you're both pissing people off and, and they're going to say this guy, this guy just doesn't get it. He's not even trying. People are watching, even if they don't tell you, Hey man, I appreciate what you're trying to do. They'll know that much. I can tell you. Scott, do you have any insights? If not, that's okay. Anything that you saw? Yeah, no, I do. Sam, when you, when you mentioned about the guys from landscaping, bringing back the earplugs, that's exactly the type of camaraderie I'm talking about. That's the stuff where you get to know all these guys and you, you become a little community, but get a CPAP machine. If you snore, it's free and people will really, really, they have, appreciate. they have them, uh, they have them at the facility. No, yeah. you have to take in Miami. It took about six months. They have to send you yeah. out for a sleep study. And by the time they schedule the sleep study and you go, if you have a CPAP machine, bring it with you. Where would I get one in the next uh, six days? It, yes, it your, I presume if you really needed one, you could get one that much I know. Yeah. Okay. So I want to be absolutely clear about that. It, I think I'm not a doctor. You may have to be diagnosed with the issue and that may be, um, mm -hmm. you know, snoring. It, 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 it just snoring not, is, I don't mean to interrupt. If, if you, you want it reimbursed, you have to be diagnosed. If you just want to get a CPAP machine, you can probably get one up on the Amazon. Yeah, you, buy, you, you yeah. buy them over the counter. That's what I was going to say. Is you yeah, buy them yeah. over the counter now. Yeah, some people, people have bought them over the counter. Hey, thank you for commenting. CVS has some people have bought it and tried to just surrendered with it. Kind of like some people try to get in with a pair of shoes. Every now and again, someone gets in with a pair of shoes. They may let you in with the machine if you want to roll the dice and buy it. I don't know if okay. you, I'm not a doctor, but that's something you want to discuss with. Mike, okay, Michael, I, yeah. I worked for a company that made CPAP testing, so I, I know a bit about it. Okay. Well, one thing we have Nate on, who's a dentist, make sure before all of you go in, get that teeth cleaning, because when yes. I was in prison, it took a year, actually, to get my teeth cleaned. Uh, in fact, I got it cleaned about a week before I was released, so it took just a little over a year. So as you go through some of your pre-sentencing preparations, uh, see that dentist one more time, because I can't tell you the health care there is, is, is best in class, which is why you manage your diet and things like that as well. I see um, some questions coming in regarding the surrender process. Uh, is it good to have family go with you when, when you ch check in? My son's, in, we're, we're going to spend the weekend with him in Montgomery before he reports. We weren't sure about whether, yeah, look, it's all, uh, I regretted going in with uh, with my mom. I wish my brother had just gone with me. I think it depends on the how the length of the sentence, how close you are, how emotionally, how well they're handling this. But certainly you can have someone walk into the prison with you and surrender when I did. I gave them my ID. They made a copy of it. I handed my wallet and everything back to my mom and brother. I was able to surrender with some money. So there could be some value in, in, in having someone go in with you if they feel like they could handle it. It can be very sad and hard to see you going in one direction and, and them in another, especially if they're not prepared for it. So it's very much a, uh, it's very much a personal decision. Someone left a comment. One of the videos had mentioned guards talking down to you in front of your wife to put you in place. We didn't think that would be good for kids to see. Uh, did anyone, I, I've had some experiences with some guards that were less sympathetic. Did you come across any disrespectful guards, Sam, Scott, or, or Nate, while you were there? And, and they, they ask about Montgomery. They'll drop them off at the visitor's center on the base. So you won't even see them go okay. into, the, the, the car will come pick you up. So that's one thing. And no, it, I mean, nothing bad. I mean, he got out and I said bye to my wife and son who brought me, but it did get emotional for a little bit for me. And, well, a lot, but, but for my wife, it hit her after she was driving back. So it was good to have my son, you know, drive her back, but she, they wanted to come. And anything regarding disrespectful staff during holiday time or any other time while, while, um, checking in or during a visit or anything like that i had one yes. experience with any what do you have yeah my wife had a whole lot of disrespect um going in it, it it really depends on the mood getting in i mean they really be careful about the colors they wear green or tan you couldn't wear any of that and nothing really tight at all um but you'll see it across the gamut i mean some people will be wearing something you're like how did they get in with that and others are told to go change and they just make you they make you go when you're there i mean you have to go to the walmart you have to go pick up clothes i mean not for 
the prisoner, but for for your for your family members. So, and you've got to, you know, at Montgomery, you had to get there early, and you know, there were lines and the way they lined up. So, there are things that you really want to know coming in. It is not going to be easy for your loved ones to really get through. It's they were herded in a lot of times. I can tell you, I, I had an experience where a guard was very sympathetic and kind. I took money out of my mom's wallet to go get her a Coca-Cola and the vending machine, but prisoners can't touch money. Yeah. And I, it was a, and the guard was very kind. He called me aside and said, I can shut down this visit right now. You're not allowed to touch money. Your mom was the one that asked to do it. And I said, I'm so sorry. I, I should have known better. I just accepted responsibility. But he could have just shut down the visit. So while some can be difficult, um, some can be very, very kind. Some can be petty and say, you're not dressed appropriately bring an extra set of clothes when you visit, just in case uh, they, they don't approve it. If not, you can get delayed about three hours. I, I wanna stress the reminder that even if you're going to a minimum security camp, crazy things can pop up. For example, did anyone hear what happened this week or a week and a half ago at the federal prison camp in Tucson, Arizona? It's tragic, thankfully no one was killed, but there are severe consequences for people in the community, in the prison, including people in our communities. Does anyone know what happened? No. Gone. So believe it or not, can you see my screen, everyone? Uh, we just see your Slack right now. Uh, you have oh, to for... scroll down. Oh, forgive me. Hold on. One second. How about now? There we go. So believe it or not, so our team has several people in our community at the federal prison camp in Tucson. Wow. This is not a penitentiary. This is the camp. And a prisoner got a gun. And we don't have all the details yet. There'll be a massive BOP and FBI investigation. But a prisoner in the camp got a gun and brought it into visitation and actually tried to shoot and kill someone. Oh, and, wow. the gun, and the gun misfired. Thankfully, no one was killed. Now, the consequences, here it is. The inmate was restrained and the gun, which had been hidden inside the facility, was retrieved. He tried to shoot a visitor when, who was there to see him. So what are the consequences that follow? And part of why our team leads these webinars is, is to kind of condition and prepare you for potential discomfort, aggravation, incredible frustration because the way prison works if somebody does one thing wrong they punish everyone it could be everything from not cleaning the microwave correctly everyone loses the microwaves there was a prisoner who was taking advantage the warden said of the typewriter therefore he removes all 17 typewriters unless you have a pending legal case but the consequences of this follow every prisoner has gone to the hole they're in isolation in the shoe Many are at the low security prisons in the FCI, and there's a chance many of them are gonna get transferred to prisons across the country, very far from their home. And I share this so you can always condition your family and let them know that regardless of what happens, you're gonna be productive and positive. And it's a shame that one person, I mean, it's terrible what happened, but everyone's prison term is disrupted. Don't know what's happening with their first step back to programming probably not visiting today because of this, they're locked in the hole. And unfortunately, there could be sweeping changes now, even to minimum security camps across the country. We may recall 20 plus years ago after 9-11, someone tried to get on an airplane with a bomb in their shoe. He was caught now every time we board a plane, we have to take our shoes off. It wouldn't surprise me if there are now metal detectors getting in and out of visitation in a camp as a result of this. This would have been a horrific tragedy had this gone through, but there will be consequences that follow. I guess the reason I share this is because oftentimes people say club fed, minimum security camp. We talk, we joke a little bit about bocce ball and pickleball and tennis and camaraderie and things like that, softball tournaments on holiday time. But this is prison after all. And I can assure you, anyone this prisoner was associating with, they're going to interview, what did you know? And it just goes down a very difficult and uncomfortable path. And we want you to be aware of this, but really condition your family if they don't hear from you, because there are people who are in Tucson whose family didn't hear from them for 10 or 11 days. And they reach out to us and say, my goodness, what has happened? 
and this is this is what's happened. So there are going to be problems all around these minimum security camps, especially on a holiday where guards may go home early. They're not even there in the chow hall to serve food. Guys are feeling depressed and down. That's when things can really go bad. Uh, so I wanted to share that story about Tucson and prepare you. Things happen. Transfers could happen. Prisons closings could happen. That happened. Half camp where I served time closed. Prisoners were transferred all across the country. We prepare as best we can, but you should condition yourself for some in inevitable disappointment. Therefore, you won't be devastated if, if something like that were to happen. Someone popped up a few minutes ago. I have a question when you have time. Are there any questions that we that we have that I'm not um, that I'm not seeing here. Are there any hands up or any questions that I can answer or our team can answer? Anything? Okay. Let's make sure. Okay. I see someone's what? hand up. I see. Uh, hi, hey, hey, Nebraska. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. Good to see you, Richie. Right. Right. <laughs> hey, um, the visitation. So. Um, I'll be probably having like a 90 month stay. And I was, we're just trying to think about how often to, to visit, you know, cause we'll, we'll be at a distance. And I didn't know if, um, if you can go back to back days of visitations or the lengths of the visits and the, themselves. Could anybody answer that? Uh, so so good. In, in Miami, it started off uh, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. You can visit all three days. Then as the population increased and it got too crowded, uh, they changed it to, they did away with Friday night and either Saturday or Sunday, depending upon the last digit of your BOP number. So if you had it one Saturday in one week, you would have it the following Sunday. Federal holidays, it was open for anybody. Um, so they would that's how it was handled in Miami. Uh, I don't know how it is with some of the other camps. I mean, Nate, Nate Scott would know. Yeah, they had, um, we were Saturday and Sunday, um, no Friday night. And around the holidays, they might do the day before and the day after, depending on the holiday. So like Christmas, the way it would, would fell that year, if it came in like the middle of the week when I was there, but just, and it was like a day in between. And then they did the same weekend visitation. So, you know, if you're visiting they they really make it want people to visit as you guys know um but but it just depends on the camp like sam said i mean they, some have uh friday nights we had 900 and something people in our camp when i reported and they were running visitation pretty efficiently i mean like i said prepare your loved ones or guests to you know there, it was not a good experience getting in once you're in it was okay but, um, you know, and you got to watch the rules, just like Justin said, I pointed across the red line to point at the vending machine of something I wanted. And just because I crossed it, I mean, we had a CO, she pulled me back there, read me the riot act. I'm going to shut your visit down. I mean, over crazy stuff. I mean, a lot of that was power driven, but I got a lot of visits. So at some point they were wanting to do that real quick too, Justin, something my wife did because guys think when you get in, you're going to be able to just reach out to everybody and, and, you know, touch them on the phone as easily as you do right now. But something she did was made friends with other wives. And I tell guys going in trading phone numbers, because when we went into lockdown during the pandemic, she knew more about what was happening at the camp in the different, um, uh, 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 areas than we knew with each other because she had made friends with different spouses and they would talk about stuff same thing about visits if visits got shut down visits they'll just shut the visit down the night before and not tell anybody well people will fly in and come and as you guys know be ready to do that so having that information is really good i say to have it if you make friends with people and you don't get a lot of visits you know because they're not going to tell anybody if you get shipped out at a moment's notice, if you've got a health problem, if you go into the hospital, they're just, they're not going to call your loved one and say, oh, by the way, you know, Nate went into the hospital tonight. They're, they're, there's no way, there's no way to tell anybody. So be very careful on that. Good advice. Thank you. And for people surrendering, I want to let you know, someone in our community who's contributed to many of our webinars, Joseph DiGregorio, you may, may remember Joseph. Joseph surrendered Eight days ago, he was told because he's not vaccinated due to health issues that he would be in quarantine for 15 days. 
And thankfully, uh, we heard that he was in quarantine for seven days. And uh, mm. th that's good news for, for any and all of you who are going to quarantine or if you're not vaccinated and they're still going to quarantine you. He uh, was out of uh, isolation or quarantine in, in seven days, which is a good thing. He's in a medical spot, but apparently he's doing he's doing just fine. And Justin, it took him a week to get any connection with anybody. I hate, I'm on his list. And yeah. for some reason they blocked him out. We didn't have that problem. We were in quarantine, but he couldn't make phone calls or email for during that time. So share with your loved ones, depending on where you are, they may not hear from you until you get out of there. Yeah. Well, there are people who have gone in during COVID where literally they're, they'll call home that day and have core links the next day. Some yep. people it's been, it's been three weeks. So it's, it's a subjective process. He's at the medical spot in, uh, in Devons. He's, he's doing just fine. Uh, he had a year and a day sentence. He should be home in a few months, three, four months. Okay, any other questions as we wrap up kind of an abbreviated post Thanksgiving um, webinar? Anything that we're, we're, are they still doing quarantine? Yes, each facility is different, but if you're in Joseph's case, he was not vaccinated due to some prior health issues and he uh, they quarantined him because of it. I believe without the quarantine, uh, then you're, uh, then they're not without if you have the vaccine you're not quarantining right now that's how i understand it sam isn't that right if you're not it depends on the facility it depends. it's all it's kind of like when we go to bop.gov and if it's the level one two or three right depending where they they may be and okay. even that's not accurate it could say level two or level three and they're <laughs> operating perfectly normal so you know we can reach out to a client that is at a specific facility if anybody has any questions i know lisa asked about uh danbury we have a, a number of women at danbury so we can find out real-time basis if anybody has any specific questions and i want to let you know that a, a client of ours someone in our community named matthew o'callahan was sentenced to 51 months at lewisburg he got out after about 18 months, maybe a little longer. He went in in July of last year. He's now at the halfway house in Newark. Uh, he'll be there for a year. I spoke with him very early this morning. Uh, he's going to get permission, but I'd like Matt to join our webinar, if not next week, the following week, to talk about his experience at Lewisburg. He went through the drug program there. He contributed and wrote a number of blogs on the White Collar Advice site as he worked on reputation management. He wrote as probation officer many of the things that our team has discussed. But as I spoke with him this morning, he said, dude, this halfway house is, I said, what, scary? He's like, scary. So we interviewed John Gustin, the former head of halfway house and reentry centers, who frequently said there is more violence and there can be more violence in these halfway houses than in a minimum security camp, which is why, like, Matt has a meeting on Monday. He's got several job opportunities, which would get him out of the halfway house for 12, 14 hours a day. And I'm telling you, if you don't have that job lined up or opportunities, many of you are going to think, damn, I wish I finished my sentence in the minimum security camp. This place is filthy. It's scary. It's violent. It's in the worst part of town. And that's why you got to have all that lined up. So I'm going to have Matt walk you through his experience. And if anyone's going to uh, Lewisburg, and also going to do the drug program there. Matt will be available to, to talk a little bit about his experience there. And um, he had, he had Brian, a really productive experience. Brian is a, was a client, and he also just got out. Brian, what was your situation? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you guys for letting Brian. me speak here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Great to see you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Um, yes, I worked closely with uh, Sam uh, prior to being uh, sentenced in I was sentenced to 10 months at Oakdale Federal Prison Camp in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to, I actually came home on Tuesday the 22nd and I served a little under four months of that 10 month sentence and was able to be uh, released on that second chance act. Um, I'm, the rest of my sentence I'll be completing on home confinement um, and anything I can do to assist uh, please ask me anything or I'm here, I'm here to help. Well, congratulations on, that's a good number on a 10 month sentence. You look great, welcome home. Please uh, thank you. continue to attend the webinars. We'll call on you and, and perhaps in the next webinar or two, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience there, or good and bad, what you saw and some lessons. So we'll coordinate that, but thank you very much for contributing. I'm happy you're home with your family for Thanksgiving. You look great, congratulations. Sure. Thank you, sure, absolutely. To the idea of when I called home, I was using the idea. I was 
I was trying to make a little joke here. I did not have a cell phone. I just used the red one. I walked into the dorm. There were six phones there. And I would just, but where the phones were right next to it is the TV room and the counselor's office. And I just tended to be a little loud. Uh, but no, I did not have an iPhone. But they were beginning to pop up while I was there. Um, but they've really become prevalent over the last few years. I see a hand up. Lisa's hand. Hi. Hello. Um, I have two questions, actually. The The first one is after you serve your, your sentence and you um, hopefully go to home confinement, but if you have to go to a halfway house, I'm serving time in Connecticut. I live in Delaware. Would I the halfway house be in Delaware or Connecticut? So, Scott, Sam, you can offer any insights. My experience in prison, they ask for a release address. You give them a release address. A probation officer will confirm that release address. And you should go to a halfway house that is closest to your confirmed release address. That's right. Unless you want someplace different, that's where you're going. Okay. I mean, that, that didn't make much sense to me if, if I'm looking for a job in Connecticut when I actually live in Delaware. So um, my other question is, you, you talk about using the phone. Do you have to sign up to use the phone at a specific time? Or if nobody's using the phone, you get to use it as long as you have minutes? How does that work? The latter. Um, we had a bank of phones, probably 10 phones. Um, they look like old fashioned pay phones, but you can't put a coin in. And if there's an open phone, you're welcome to use it. Uh, 15 minutes per call, 30 minutes between calls. Right now, uh, you get 500 minutes a month of free phone calls. Um, when I was there, it was 300 minutes a month, uh, but you had to pay for it. Now, I believe still under the CARES Act, 500 minutes a month of free phone calls. Just be very judicious about your minutes. You can't buy more minutes. I've had many, many people say, well, if I run out of minutes, can I buy more? No. <laughs> you get your minutes. Uh, I would check every morning. I think it was pound 108. And I would check every morning how many minutes I had left in my cycle. I have okay, the thanks. watch. I used a watch, Sam. And I, li I like that you said not just free phone calls because they get the 500 minutes, but that's all you get to use in the month. I mean, you can't, there's no buying more, like you said. And I saw a lot of guys, there's a lot of stuff that will go on at home. And if you're not monitoring those, I use it on my stopwatch. You know, I bought that little Timex that they have with the light and the, the, the alarm. I didn't buy an alarm clock, but that would wake me up. But I would just time my minutes and each day I knew. And then sometimes I had to go longer. But a lot of guys, they'll run out of minutes in, you know, a week. And then, you know, they don't have any way to deal with anything. So that's really good. Yeah. And that's where some people become vulnerable to using an iPhone if they've run out of phone minutes. Uh, it's like watch somebody. It's like watching a guy Jones come off of information. I mean, it's amazing that disconnection. Which you know, I tell guys going in, be careful. It it changes when you go in, and you will not have connection. And the COs, the guards, the warden, they're not there to help you get an upgrade on your your stay in the room. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. So if you run out, you run out. And be, be exceptionally careful. Some people will try and sell you their minutes or say you could use my number and call your family. Um, I've seen people get kicked out of RDAP for that. They do not mess around with the phones. Nope. They listen to them. That's right. That's exactly, I've seen that too. It was crazy. It happened at RDAP and ours too. That, 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 that's right. I see a Zoom user in the top left with a hand up. Uh, please ask away if we've not answered it. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I'm in uh, Zuzu land, Iowa, and um, my son was just sentenced to four years for a remark he made on um, Facebook. I don't want to get into the craziness of that, but just how crazy is an appeal situation? And the more I look at it, the more it's like a joke, like a lot of things in the justice system. So when you're in there, can you ever rely on uh, like an appeal or how do you deal with that as a, as a prisoner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If I understood the question correctly, he's going to be appealing the length of his sentence. Um, I think he's, yeah, he's appealing, I guess the whole deal, you yeah. know, like the okay. fact that it was 61 pages of terrorism and they used a little remark he made on a Facebook private yeah, I got book. It. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So to answer your question, if he has a pending legal case, when he goes to prison, if he's not already there, he can bring legal papers with him, just write legal mail on the outside. If he mm -hmm. has a pending, if he has an appeal taking place, he can manage that appeal from prison. 
he will get his lawyer approved. Well, Scott had an appeal in prison. Scott, well, how did you man? Scott managed an appeal in prison. Um, sure, I'll I'll say this: it it's it can be a double edged sword. It can give you a ray of hope, thinking this is going to end. I'll be out of here any day now, and and it, it can stop people from settling in. I will say this about appeals: Michael told me something similar, and I disregarded the advice. It is pricey. It is lengthy. I actually won my appeal. Um, we had oral arguments. One part of the appeal, my entire sentence was vacated, and I couldn't get in front of the judge for that second hearing until I was out of prison. So well, you're probably up, talking about a public pretender versus a paid lawyer, and there's a hell of a difference with that. Either way, whether it's a, I don't know about public pretenders because I have found public defenders to be fantastic and incredible, and many of them are better than. Trust me, it wasn't them. here. Well, whatever it is, all I know is this. If your son wants to manage an appeal in prison, he can. He will get the lawyer approved. And he's on, got legal rights to receive all that mail. Et that, that is correct. He can, yes. Okay, and great. even a lot, of the, a lot of these prisons, the typewriters, they're only allowed to be used for a pending legal case. But absolutely, he can manage the appeal. We have someone in custody right now when they have phone calls with their lawyer. The, our client goes into the case manager's office, the case manager leaves, and they have phone calls that do not count against the 500 minutes. They are not recorded. Emails are different, however. Uh, we do have uh, people in our community who will email the lawyers, but it's not privileged. Anyone can access that information. I think it's a flaw. It's a problem. You should be able to have private email Very communication, uh, but you don't. And that's just the Bureau of Prisons, and it's not currently set up to do that. But in sum, if if your son, and we empathize that he's going away for four years, if if he has a pending legal case, he can manage it. We'd encourage you. He's got to avoid problems. He's going to get good time, things of that nature. We don't want to take a, a Th bad That brings situation. up one other question. Do they actually tell you what the rules are? Are you supposed to guess and then you run into all that? I mean, do they tell you when you go in a place, they, like hand the rules to you, et well, there's there, there, there's a there's a handbook, but part of the reason our team Wonderful. creates... Part of the reason our team we have this community and we yeah, create you guys this, are awesome thank you the reason we create this free content is to to teach him how to teach everyone how to advocate it's very much self-paced self-directed their guards not going to call them aside and say these are the rules and these are the do's and don'ts and these are the nuances of the prison it doesn't work that way it, it just does not so that's the reason we're here to to try to help and it requires work it requires learning about disciplinary infractions learning about interacting with staff the importance of adjusting properly and worst case not losing uh, not losing the good time and I know it's sad and I empathize that he's going uh, and I'm sorry but we cannot make matters worse and some people do make matters worse by losing their good time I opened the webinar by mentioning someone went to the halfway house they were disrespectful to the case manager they didn't get back from their pass on time and the case managers like had the marshals come and the guy's going to finish the he'll do Christmas and Thanksgiving in the new year in the detention center. He's not going back to the camp. And it's like, wow. And had he done the drug program, they'd have probably taken his year away, but he didn't. You know, so you're not free until you're free. Make sure as tough as this is, he doesn't make matters worse. Well, it will be easy to make it worse, but we both know what you're saying. So I thank all of you. You're very welcome. A happy holidays. Thank you for contributing. All right. Any other questions or anything that I'm missing and i have some very bad news at the end of this webinar i'm going to share with you i'm just kidding here's the bad news i won't be <laughs> leading them next week i'm actually going to be out of town on friday and saturday and unavailable i don't know what that means who's going to lead them i think michael who's been traveling doing all of his advocacy work across the country this dude travels and works like you've never seen he's back on the prison program i can get in text from him at 1 30 in the morning he is never stopping advocating and working um so I'm going to be off the grid next Friday and Saturday, but I think Michael's going to contribute. We have Sam, Scott, and others. We'll come up with the idea of what we're going to do, but it will certainly be the real structure of what you're used to every week. I just thought today would be nice to have some communications about um, holidays in prison and go through some, some good Q&A, but we'll get back to it on a real set agenda next week with Michael and everyone else, and I'll return in two weeks. Any other questions? So are we doing it tomorrow, Justin? Negative. No? We're just going to do okay. one that we're just going to do one this week. Okay. Uh, we, we will have the recording of this. We'll send out. But next Friday and Saturday, we'll be back on with a structure. I think Michael will want to go through some of the changes to the First Step Act. There's been a lot of writing on that. So changes to the First Step Act. 
We'll go through what we're learning from experts that we're hiring. Uh, we will go through the calculator again, but we'll also, you know, there'll be a lot of new content that we'll cover. And I'll discuss that with Michael, who I believe is on a plane to Dallas right now. But we'll coordinate all of that with the team and I'll return in uh, two weeks from today. Hey, Justin, can I, can I say something to the everybody on yes. here? You know, I, I am. I feel like I'm part of the team, but I, as I, indirectly, I, I'm a. I was a client, and you know, still am, and and am not part of of your team. But people have been asking me, you know, what did I do on that 33 month sentence to only spend 10 months? I didn't get CARES Act. I did. First step wasn't put in place. And guys, I'm going to tell you, I followed everything that they said. I um I don't get paid to say this, so please know, guys, hire them. I promise you this stuff, it's going to happen. You're going to come home, but I'm telling you, this team is amazing. And, and I, that's why I come back here. I mean, it, it also reminds me, you know, to keep my gratitude and, you know, I, I'm, I'm with all of you guys and anything I can always do, but I'm telling you, Justin, Michael, um, Sam, uh, Scott, these guys know their stuff in and out. And I'm telling you, it will be here, but prepare you know, what, it, what does it say? If you fail to, you know, plan, you plan to fail. So that's what you've shown. And that's how I got, got off. I don't, my lawyers didn't even know I was working with you guys. And, you know, they were wondering, where's all this stuff coming from? And how are you doing all this? And I said, you know, I'm researching it, but you guys were in the background and in the forefront. And I got home early because of it, RDAP, everything. So thank you. And I'm done off paper. Thank you. It's it great. Nate, thank you for, for sharing that. We're, we're appreciative. Uh, Nate did get off paper early. I mentioned that earlier. If you have questions about that process, just send us a message uh, about how Nate went uh, about, about that. And we're going to be doing much more work on that. I followed and, your advice. That's how. <laughs> well, but also you had the good package. You had a good package. I did. I did. Yes. You had, very, you had a great package that was submitted to the to the court. Yeah. It is, it's really, it's harder to get off probation when you still owe restitution that that's yeah, about 860,000 I think I still owe so yeah yeah so uh, and he'll pay it off too I have no doubt yes. next time took me nine years it does Lisa I did see the question about for our team will be Lisa can you tell us your surrender date again yeah I, I have to surrender January 9th okay so we'll okay so we'll, we'll certainly coordinate with you early next week about the spe specific questions about forfeiture and whatnot but count on our team I also filmed a video that we called Man the Pros and Cons of Managing Restitution, what that's like before, during, and after prison. Have you seen that video I filmed? I have not. Um, uh, uh, that will end. I, I'd like you to watch that video before we have a conversation about forfeiture and restitution. I will send that to you, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. In fact, uh, in fact, well, hold on one second. Everyone stay on for a second. Let me just put, Lisa, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put that YouTube video all right, Lisa, watch that video and then we'll we'll have a conversation. Um, like we'll have a conversation on it next week once I get back in town, okay? All right, guys, so short of that, we're going to wrap up our webinar. Happy holidays to all of you. So grateful that you're joining us following a Thanksgiving. Hope you have a wonderful, safe holiday weekend and we will see you all next Friday. Thank you everyone for contributing. Thanks, all. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye, guys.